Welcome everyone. Um, I'm going to share my story, Leading with Imperfect Feet. Um, people have, um, I've always been successful in change and I've been thinking recently to why is that? Why, why is it that it just seems so natural to do that? And as I reflect on my life and as I tell this story um, about a simple walk on the beach, it leads to a perfect metaphor of what is needed to drive change what it's needed as a leader to create that environment so the people you're fortunate enough to serve can help move toward that change. So welcome. Last February, uh, my wife and I decided to go on vacation. It was a two week vacation. The first week we went on a cruise. The second week we went to Florida. And what do you do when you go to Florida? You go to the beach. So uh, it wasn't the first time I was ever at the beach. I sat from the top of the beach, staring into the water, uh, into the sky like I always have. I always found it very tranquil, and I always found it so open with possibility, just to look and to see the, the simplicity. But today was going to be different. Today I wanted to really feel what it would be like to go to the water, to go into the ocean and feel that. Because for 40 years before, I've always been looking at it from this view. But what would it be like to be there? So before I tell you, you would think walking to the water should be straightforward. And I would imagine for everybody in this room, it would be pretty straightforward. You just get up and walk to the water. But as you can tell, walking isn't my expertise. Um, I was born with cerebral palsy. Um, and with cerebral palsy, they told me when I was born that I wouldn't live past two days. Um, and, and furthermore, um, I couldn't really talk until I was 12 years old. Unfortunately for you today, I can talk now. <laughs> and you never so, stop. So now you're going to hear my story. Um, so. Simple as getting up in the morning, it seems pretty easy. You just get out of bed, shower, shave, or brush your teeth, whatever everybody does to get out the door, just to start the day. For me, that's been complexity. For me, at an early age, I had to have healthcare professionals at 14. I had to build a team Davy to really organize and help me what seemed so trivial to get out of bed to get out of bed so I can just face the day. Because just like that day on the beach, I didn't want to spend all my life in that bed. I didn't want to spend all my life in that room. I wanted to see what it would be like. And same with talking. It was weird. Um, not being able to talk to you at 12, everybody asked me what my motivation was. And it was probably because I had a voice inside me that needed to be heard. And it was very vulnerable to talk, because when I was 12 years old, I was in grade school, and kids are anything but nice in grade school. So they would make fun of the way I would talk, but I had to let go of those insecurities and move on. Because if I knew I wanted to tell my story someday, it would have to start speaking then. So let's go back to the beach. So that day I was sitting there, um, looking into the water, I figured, you know what? I've had enough of looking at it from the distance. Today, I was going to go to the water. So I asked my uh, wife and my friend to be able to uh, pick me up and begin my walk. Before I had to start it, I had to realize, like everything before me, people were going to judge me. Why is it he's getting dragged to the water? Is he alive? Is he dead? Are they trying to hide the body? Um, <laughs> but I had to let go of those insecurities to know what it was like. And uh, it, was a, it was a ridiculous struggle. But uh, I remember my first step in the sand. I've, always, I've been able to step before. I've been walking in shoes on flat platforms. But this was the first time I didn't have the, the security of the shoes, the structure. And it's the first time I stepped in the sand. And the feeling was so ridiculously awesome. As you step in, 
the warmness of it and the way it hugged your feet. Even though my feet were imperfect, the sand was so grainy that it would find a way to hug in its imperfections and squeeze it. And stepping into the sand is a lot harder than pavement. You had to pull yourself out and put it in each time. And then uh, I fell. And then as you can imagine, when I fell, everybody was looking at me. And I was kind of scared, embarrassed. But then I had a decision to make because I was looking up in the sky and everybody looking down at me. I could easily go back to where I started, just 10 feet away, or I could get back up and continue that walk. So what I did was I realized, just like everything before, the reason why would be greater than the struggle. I had to push through because I wanted to know on this day what it would feel like to go into the water. So we got back up, started walking again, and then I fell again. But the funny thing is, is every other time I fell after the first time, it was a little bit easier to get back up. And you know, I almost felt like a weeble wobble. They wobble, but they don't fall down. So I got back up. And just as I was getting used to that beautiful sand, warm going, you get to wet sand. And the wet sand doesn't feel nearly as good to the feet. It's clumpy, it's cold. But if I wanted to experience something that I've never had, sometimes you gotta go through things that aren't pleasant. So I continued to walk through the mud, going into the water. And being in the water was a, a different sensation because when you're in with the waves, sometimes you're vulnerable with the waves and let the water bring you. And sometimes you hold tight and resistant. But every time I kept taking a step and kept taking a step, I was so locked into uh, feeling everything because every step felt like a marathon. And I kept going and going because you sometimes never know when to stop or did you do enough. And I went all the way up until the water was on my, my chest. Because so I knew if I kept walking, I'd eventually drown. But, uh, but I was able to see the water and sky from a closer perspective that I never have. And I realized, did I walk enough? Did I do enough? It wasn't until we turned around and I looked at the shore. I looked at the shore. I looked at a place where I spent the rest of my life before that moment and how it looks different from being way over there. What seems so big, real, and scary seems a little more insignificant from a distance and smaller. So for the first time in my life, I could see where my life was from that new perspective. Now, the trick is when you're gonna take on a challenge, the why has gotta be greater than the struggle and there's gonna be a struggle. The reason why this, this simple walk on the beach mirrors so well when you do organizational change, think about the way society is. And when I had to make that decision to walk on the beach, I had to say, are people gonna stare at me? Are people gonna judge me? Will I make it? Will I succeed? I had no clue. But I knew with each time I fell, I was closer than when I was when I was sitting there, not even trying at all. So when you go into organizations and they're a microcosm of society, we're judged by what we do. We either have success or failure is heavily judged. We see successful people and think they had an easy walk to the water. It was very easy for them. Or people that are failing, we think, aren't trying hard enough. Because in society, and just like in organizations, we spend a lot of effort to not be vulnerable. Because we're, because to show vulnerability puts the illusion that we're scared. But really to be vulnerable isn't, it doesn't mean you're scared. It means you're braver because you're going to accept everything around you. You have to be, be vulnerable because if you don't take that change, if, if you don't realize you're going to make a move to uncertainty, you won't ever take that first step. But just like I have never changed an organization myself. I've had to work with many people and I've had to have the luxury to work with great teams. 
one person might be able to spark the change, but it takes a whole team and group and a whole ecosystem to help provide that change. So as a leader, I need to help really create a kind of a force field around where, where we can embrace vulner vulnerability, we can, we can promote empathy, and we can embrace that. We can provide transparency, we can have wide open collaboration and open community. And now everybody knows that, you know, you can't just hire the perfect team. I'm partial, I think I have, but, but the thing is, is um, it comes with a lot of work from the team and myself. Just like people take uh, getting out of bed for granted, maybe walking along the beach for granted or even talking, making regular touch points with your staff or with your employees are so important. How often do we brush away one-on-ones? We get too busy with other initiatives. Oh, we'll talk to them later. We'll, we'll, we'll get to know them at another social event or, hey, if worst case, I'll talk to them during their performance review because that's the one time a year at least we're gonna have face-to-face. -face. That does not work. In today's, in today's modern organizations, your employees are, are smarter than you in their specific domains. So you don't, really need to, you don't really need to teach them anything. You need to create a relationship to make them feel safe, to make them open up into insecurities, to make them go, you know what? You're gonna make mistakes, but we're gonna get there. So your job in a leader is really utilizing all their talents. They might be, you know, exceptional in release management. They might be exceptional in communications. They might be exceptional scrum masters. But you just need to know how to build a mechanism where they can share their vulnerabilities with each other and support each other through all these things. So when you deal with a one-on-one, -on -one, what I do with a lot of uh, the people I work with is they get so busy doing what initiatives and changes they're doing. They're so hyper-focused on it. Just like I could feel every grain of the sand. When they're trying to do something different or do something new in an organization, they're more sensitive. When somebody says something, they take it worse than they ever did because they're struggling so much. So what I do as a leader is make them realize that they are doing enough. Because they're like, I, I don't feel we're doing enough. John Doe is super successful and they're having an easy time. Uh, Mary Smith, look at what she's done. She's done fantastic and it comes easy. What I have to remember them is the struggle is always there. It might not be visible. And help them realize since, they start, since we started working together or since we started the initiative, I need them to turn around in the water and see how far they've come. Because sometimes in moving the step forward, they don't realize how far they've came. And building that bond and getting them to appreciate where they are from where they've been, you need to help motivate them or where they want to go to. And we can't take that for granted. Just like we all need it, everybody needs it. So you need to build that relationship of trust individually and with a group. And you have to make it okay to fail. You have to give them permission to make mistakes. And as a leader, we want to stop them, right? We want to go, oh no, don't do that. That would be scary. I'd like to share an example with uh, somebody I, I work with. I hired a, a scrum master that didn't really have any uh, scrum or agile experience, but he had a ridiculous EQ. It was way off the charts. So when I hired him, because sometimes you can't hire for a current skill you need at the moment, because you're always going to be changing. You need to hire the right behaviors so they can develop the skills you're going to need tomorrow. But I hired him, I brought him in and put him on this team. And if I call him a team, I'm being, overly, uh, I'm being overly optimistic. There were a group of people that didn't really talk to each other and didn't really work together. It was just a bunch of individuals that happened to share a space and maybe shared the bathroom a few times. Hopefully not the disabled, so. Um, but he made a great team. Within weeks, they were laughing together, they were noisy, it was great. So he was new and enthusiastic, and this team was pushing through to get their backlog done. 
We only had a sprint left, and we had about double the work the velocity could do. And he come to me and goes, the team feels they can get it done. And I've been around the block many times. I'm looking at the numbers. I'm like, OK. And he's like, you're going to see. Because two things could have happened. If I stopped him there, he'd only do it because I told him that he should refocus and replan. Or two, he could have done it and showed me something to learn. But I came to the end of the sprint, and obviously they didn't finish all the work they were done that they needed to do. He came in my office, and this, this, this guy that's usually smiley, bright-faced, full of energy, was depleted. He came in and went, I screwed up. I'm like, OK. He goes, the team didn't finish the sprint. I screwed up. I said, I heard you. I'm disabled, not deaf. <laughs> So I, so I said, what are you going to do about it? And he goes, well, I think I'll notify the, the stakeholders, work with the team to see how much work's left, see how creatively we can do it to reduce you know, the extra time needed. So he did it, and it was great. The funny thing is, is, a few weeks after that, I was in the same predicament. I was scrum mastering a couple teams. I was going by the data, but we were getting a deadline. Pressure was coming in. I was listening to the enthusiasm of the estimates of the team. I'm like, they're going to do it. I can inspire them. They didn't do it. So I called the same person in my office, because I thought, what better way to show failure is OK than to show him I failed? Usually, I have many other examples of where I made mistakes and failed, but for this talk, I'll use this one. He came in, and I said, you know, I have a lot of experience. I should have known we weren't going to do it. I screwed up. And then I kept talking. I can't believe I did this. I screwed up. And he looked at me and went, Dave, I'm not deaf. I heard, I heard you the first time. What are you going to do about it? It's funny, just like in my walk, when sometimes I was being led to the water, sometimes I was following, being led. As a leader, in that example, I became a follower because I was able to get led by somebody I just mentored to do that. Because just like that trip to the ocean wasn't a straight line success, just like I didn't wake up in the morning to talk right away, success comes from learnings of falling and getting back up. There is no straight line to success, There's, and success is relative. You only learn by doing, and falling and getting back up. But that takes courage that you need to do as a leader. I know what I'm sounding is you're probably saying motherhood and apple pie, but how many of you that are leaders continually skip your one-on-ones, continually don't build a relationship with your employees? We all fall in that trap, and we all do that. But it's something that I know I've had to trust, because in my life, it was funny. Uh, my friend one day was pushing me on the dock, and he said, Dave, you know what amazes me most about you? And he's pushing me on the dock, and there's 20 feet on each side with rocks. And I'm like, what is that? He goes, the fact that you've got to put your life in other people's hands so often. And I'm thinking to myself, why is he picking this moment to tell this story? Is he, is he just gonna, is he just gonna throw me off? But in only to be successful, I have to be vulnerable. I have to give in to my team and the organization of rock stars. We have to work with the people group. I can't call them each other. I have to call them people group because. I've, been, I've gotten to see the big difference. And working together, that's how we help move an organization. Um, it's been over a year and a half since I've been working with uh, Blue Cat. And the amount of change didn't come by one person or a group of people. It came from a team. It came from working across teams. Because we all gave vulnerability into each other. We all put trust into each other. Because we have to put our lives in each other's hands. We have to put our trust in other people's hands to move an organization. Now, if I just ended the story there, 
it'd be a pretty telling story. So after I got off that walk on the beach, I went back up in the sand and I was staring at my imperfect feet. In my peripheral vision, there was an older gentleman in a walker making his way down the sand. Uh, I shouldn't be surprised to see an older gentleman in Florida, but the fact that he was going in the walker and falling and he was getting back up. And I watched him. When he fell, I was staring at him like other people were staring at me. And he made it to the water. And I thought, wow, he got to experience the water. As he was coming up, he goes by me. And he goes, I did it too. And I'm like, did seeing me in the water give you that inspiration to do that? He's like, no. It was watching you fall down, get back up, and look stupid. <laughs> but you just think to yourself, if it wasn't the success of my journey that got to the water that motivated him, it was the openness and willingness to be vulnerable, to show the struggle, to show the resilience, in society and organizations where we're conditioned to not show these things as they're a sign of weaknesses. If we want to motivate those around us, if we want to inspire those, I encourage you to be transparent to the struggle. Be open to who you are to show what it's been. Because if we can be like the sand and embrace that, embrace my imperfect feet or embrace your imperfect feet. If you can let go of your insecurities and fears, if you can help others get a voice, you can achieve what's possible. Because you don't know what's possible until you left what has been. So just think to yourself, if you're able to be transparent, if you're, ever, if you're able to be yourself, if you're allowed to be wrong, imperfect in this imperfect world, be that voice, build those relationships, work together. What could be possible? What could be possible? Thank you.